Today, I'm going to start lecture um, talking about titrations. So last week, you guys did um, a lab on titrations where you guys had some vinegar and some ammonia. You guys put some beads um, that will turn the solution sort of like red, pink, and you add ammonia until the solution turns sort of purple. You guys did that three times. So basically you add ammonia into the vinegar solution until the solution change color um, where the solution changes color we call that the end point. And that's when you stop adding more ammonia, which in this case is the titrant into the vinegar, which is what we call the analyte. So the titrant is what you're adding and it's something that you know, you know the identity and you know the concentration. The analyte is what you're studying. Are you wanting to be sharing your screen? What? Are you wanting to be sharing your screen? Because it sounds like you're writing. I am writing and I'm not sharing my screen. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to look at what I'm doing. That might be good. Yeah. This makes more sense. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's do this again. But maybe we can go faster this time. So we're talking about titrations. This week, we did a titration of vinegar with ammonia. So ammonia, we were working with um, a 0 0.5 molar concentration. So you guys knew the identity because you guys knew it was ammonia and you guys knew the concentration, which was 0.5. That was the first thing you guys did. You guys have vinegar, you guys put some vinegar, you guys added some beads, and that solution turned sort of like pink, red color. You guys added ammonia, which in this case is what we call titrant, which is the chemical that you're adding in. Um, and you add it until the solution turn into the purple light color and when you reach that purple color you stop adding indicator and that's what we call the end point so every time you're talking about the end point of any titration is when the solution turns color so when you're doing a titration, there's a few things you need. Um, the first one is the titrant. We talk about the titrant. So it's something that you know the identity and the concentration. You need the analyte. And the analyte is what, you're, what you are studying. And in this last lab, you knew the identity but you didn't know the concentration. So you use the titration to figure out the concentration of your analyte, which in this case was vinegar. Last thing you need is something to know when to stop the titration. And in this case, we use beads, which is a pH indicator. 
This week, our new our lab for this week is sort of similar, but instead of using a pH indicator, we're gonna use a pH probe. I will talk about this later, but for now we're gonna focus a little bit on titrations with a pH indicator. So we did our titration. Let's say that in our titration, we start um, with seven milliliters of vinegar. And in the red, our initial volume of ammonia which was 0.5 molar was let's say 23.5 milliliters then the final volume so the amount of milliliters that took up ammonia to make the solution go from pink to purple um, the volume was 14.2 milliliters. So with this information, you're gonna to try to find the concentration of acetic acid in our sample. So to find Concentration, I know I need two different things. I need moles and I need liters. I know I use seven milliliters of vinegar, which means I know the volume of vinegar or the, mol the volume of acetic acid that I use. So I can say that my volume is 0 0.007 liters. What I don't know is how many moles I had, and that's what I use, that's what I'm gonna use my titration for. So to find the moles, I'm just gonna use um, stoichiometry. So I will start by writing my balanced chemical equation. So NH3 plus CH3COOH goes and forms NH4 plus in CH3COO minus. So from here, I know that this reaction is a one-to-one -one ratio. So now that we know it's a one-to-one -one ratio, we can proceed to actually find the concentration. So I know it took from 23.5 milliliters to 14.2 milliliters to find or to get to the endpoint. So the first thing we'll have to do is do the difference in volume to figure out how much of the base we needed, which in this case is 9.3 milliliters. So it took 9.3 milliliters of NH3 to get to the endpoint. So I'm gonna change that two liters. And I know that in one liter of ammonia, I had 0.5 moles. And I know this because I made my solution to be 0.5 molar. Then based on the valence chemical equation, I know that one mole of NH3 reacts with one mole of CH3COOH. So this calculation will actually give me how many moles of ammonia, ammonia I initially had in my sample, which in this case I had 0 0.00465 moles of acetic acid. So going back to find the concentration of acetic acid, I know my volume was 0 0.007, and I, now I know that my moles were 0 
four, six, five. So to find the concentration, I just need to take that divided by 0 0.007, and that will give me 0.664 molar. So this is how we use um, a titration with an indicator to find the concentration of our sample. So basically the idea of titration, at least, at least titration in this case is you have a container of vinegar and you want to know the concentration of vinegar in this container. You take some volume out. So in this case, you took seven milliliters and then you titrated that to figure out how much of your titrant you need to reach that endpoint. And when you reach the endpoint, you can then use chemistry to figure out the concentration of vinegar in your sample. In the lab, you also did um, calculations going from concentration to percent. You don't really need to know that for the class. Um, at least for like the lecture portion. So you don't have to worry about knowing those things for the quiz or for the exam. So for the exam and the quiz, this is, a, I guess, this is as far as you need to know. Good, any questions about titrations? No, makes sense. Okay. So that is titrations with an indicator. And that's something you guys should sort of know from chemistry 141, because you guys actually do a titration with an indicator in chemistry 141. In chemistry, in chemistry 142, we add titrations with a pH probe. So, something we need to know about, and let's make this note, titrations with a pH indicator is to be able to do a titration with a pH indicator the titrant and the analyte must be known, which means that like, you need to know what titrant you're working with, and you also need to know what analyte you're working with. Why is that? So if you're trying, trying to do a titration with a pH indicator, let me actually take or put an example. Let's say you're working with acetic acid. This was our, or this is our analyte. And we're adding, let's make it easy with sodium hydroxide. So we're doing a titration that is similar to what you guys did in chemistry 141. So in the titration, the idea is that you're gonna add NOH enough to neutralize the acetic acid. So you're going to react, you're doing this reaction, you're gonna be forming H2O, and you're going to be forming NaCH3COO. So let's say initially you have a 0.5 molar acetic acid. So for the titration, you're gonna add enough NOH until the concentration of NOH is the same as the acetic acid. That's when you reach the endpoint. So you will have to add NOH up to 0.5 molar. So then all my acid will react with 
in this case, my NOH. So then I have zero and zero. So if this is true, I will be forming 0.5 molar of acetate. So at the end, I will have 0 0.5 molar left of acetate. Okay, so just sort of to summarize, at the end point, the moles, or we can say, or we could say molar concentration of the titrant equals the moles of the analyte. So the analyte is neutralized. And that's sort of what happened in this reaction. So basically we had some acetic acid and we kept adding NOH. We did it slowly in the titration. So, but we wanted to add it enough. So these two numbers are the same. Okay. And we added and we knew the numbers were the same with the pH or when, when the solution changed color. So when the acetic acid and the sodium hydroxide have the same concentration, they will both get neutralized and then you will have an excess of your conjugate species. So in this case, when the acetic acid equals the sodium hydroxide, you will have sodium acetate with a concentration of 0 0.5 molar. Sodium acetate is actually a weak base, which means that sodium acetate, when it's mixed in water, it actually breaks down and forms CH3, COOH, acetic acid, and it also forms NaOH. So if you have an excess of sodium acetate, you will actually have this reaction where acetate reacts in water and form these two chemicals. And since acetate is a weak base, X amount will break down and X amount of these two products will be formed. So at the end, you're gonna have 0 0.05 molar minus X of sodium acetate, you have X amount of acetic acid and X amount of sodium hydroxide. If that is true, then you know that you can find the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Um, if you are interested in knowing like what pH that will be. So in this case, Kb will equal X squared divided by 0 0.5 minus X. So then we'll do the 5% rule. But to do the 5% rule, we need to find the Kb, which the Kb is actually 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. Since this K is so small, we know that it will pass the 5% rule. So I can say that KB equals X squared divided by 0 0.5, which means that X equals the square root of KB times 0 0.5. So X equals the square root of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10 times 0.5. which is 1.67 times 10 to the negative five. And then to find the pH, the first thing I have to do is find the pOH, which will be the negative log of 1.6 times 10 to the negative fifth, which is 4.78. So then my pH will be 14 minus 4.78 
which is 9.22. So the pH of that reaction, so when we neutralize the acetic acid with sodium hydroxide, when we mix it too, the pH at that point is about 9.22. So what am I doing all of this? Most likely this doesn't really make a lot of sense to you guys. Like, okay, we put a pH indicator. So why are we trying to find the pH? So this is sort of like to explain the difficulty of doing a titration with a pH indicator. So let me search for something. So these are two tables showing different pH indicators. So when you're trying to do a titration with an indicator, the first thing you need to know is that you need to be able to identify what indicator to use. So let's say I'm titrating CH3, COOH with NOH. I know when the CH3OOH and the NOH have the same concentration, the pH will be about 9.2. So to find the correct pH indicator, I will have to trace a line down around that pH and trying to figure out what indicator will work best. This is the titration you guys did in chemistry 141 and the indicator you guys used was phenophylline. Why do we use phenophylline? Because if you look at carefully, you can see that the indicator that is actually changing colors around 9, 9.2 is phenophylline. In the lab that we did this past week, uh, week when we titrated CH3COOH with ammonia, the pH at that point where the amount is the same, the same is closer to seven. So that's why this is maybe not the best table, but that's why we were able to use beets because the pH is closer to seven. So what I'm trying to say is in order to be able to do a titration with a pH indicator, you need to know what two chemicals you are working with because you need to be able to calculate the pH at the equivalence point. You need to know the pH, the pH at the equivalence point and the equivalence point. is another way to talk about that point where the moles analyte equal the moles of the titrate. Equivalence meaning they're the same. So you need to be able to find that pH and so you, so you can find what indicator to use. If the pH at the equivalence point is let's say seven, and this will be true if we titrate something like Let's say we have HCl plus NaOH. If you're doing that titration, we will form water, which is neutral, and we will form NaCl, which is neutral, which means that our pH has to be around seven, because everything that you form 
if this is gone and this is gone, is all neutral. So for that titration, will we use phenol failing? The answer is no, because phenol failing is going for pH on a pH range of 8.2 to 10. So instead, we want to have something that falls into, um, or the pH range falls around seven. So if you look at the different areas, we can see that either this chemical will work or this indicator will work, and also this indicator will work. So that is um, about titrations with a pH probe, sorry, with a pH indicator. So this part is about titration with a pH probe. So when do we do titrations with a pH probe? When the titrant is known, but the analyte is not known. This week, you will do a titration with a pH probe, but since you're doing it at home, you will actually know the titrant and the analyte. So the idea is for you to know, to learn how to do a titration with a pH probe. Uh, but in real life, if you knew the titrant and the analyte, you will do a titration with an indicator and not with a pH probe. With a pH probe, you get more information, but it just takes a little bit more time. Okay, so to do a titration with a probe, you have a known analyte and an unknown, sorry, a known titrant and an unknown analyte. The idea is sort of similar. For titration with a pH indicator, we normally use an Erlenmeyer flask, and then we get our burette, and then we add our titrant. For the pH probe, instead of using the Erlenmeyer flask, you're gonna use a beaker. And we're gonna use most likely for your kid, the 600 milliliter beaker. Why? Because we want to be able to have the burette aligned so you can put some titrant into the solution, but we also want to be able to keep our pH probe inside that solution. So you can add some titrant swirl the solution and keep track of the pH without having to take the pH probe in and out. So using a beaker will be the most efficient way of doing this. So how do you do a titration with a pH probe? So initially, let's say our analyte is acetic acid. So we have a weak acid In our beaker, then let's say our titrant is ammonia. So we have a weak base in the burette. So the pH for my acid should be around four. The pH for my base should be around nine. So what you are going to do is you are going to add titrant to the analyte in small increments. The lab report says between 0 0.5 to one milliliters at a time. And you're gonna keep track or record the pH after each addition. So you're basically going to create a table where you have volume of titrant, and you can say added or transferred, and pH. So I add, let's say I added 0 0.5, my pH was 4.10, then I added like one mil more, 
So I added one mil. So now I added total 1.5. So when you're putting the volume of Triton added, it's cumulative, which means like you keep adding on top of what you already added. It's not just the increment that you just added. So if I add it here like um, two milliliters, now, now I am, I am at 2.5. So let's say I have 4.21, 4.27 and you're going to keep doing this until you reach a basic pH. So we're gonna go through all the acid because if you're in the acidic pH, that means that you're still having some excess of weak acid. So you want to make sure you neutralize it, which means that you want to make sure that all these acidic pHs are going to be gone. Are you gonna keep adding it until you get to like something maybe like 8.53, 8.57, So you will see that your titration at some point would sort of plateau in the basic pH. So you wanna go from acidic to basic. Let's say this is like 15.7, 16.2 and so on. So the idea is that you're gonna start with the pH of your analyte and you're gonna keep adding titran until the solution has a pH that resembles what the titran's pH is. If my titran pH is nine, most likely I won't really get to nine because I have so much liquid in my beaker already that the concentrations are gonna be so diluted that I won't really get to that high of a pH. But you will see that you will go from a low pH to sort of like a high pH. So after you get that table, the next thing you need to do is you need to go to Excel and you're going to make a graph. Yay. I like using Excel, so this is cool. And you're gonna make a graph that is going to be an X, Y scatter that is only points. We are not going to have any lines. The graphs or the patterns that Excel gives you don't follow um, how this graphs look like. So you're just gonna have points. Okay, so the X axis is going to be volume of titran. I'm gonna say added. In this case was NH3. Let's say we are using 0.5 more. Then on the other axis, for the Y axis, you're going to have the pH of the solution. I'm gonna to add to my X axis my units. So that will be milliliters. For my Y axis, pH doesn't have any units. So I will not put any units there. For my title, I will say, I titrate it, so titration. Uh, let's say I use eight milliliters of acetic acid with 0 0.5 molar ammonia. So I got my y axis, I got my x axis, and I got my title. So then I just need to select all my values from my table and let, let Excel plot it. Most likely you're gonna have something like this, or hopefully you have something like that. So you will see that initially everything was acidic because we have an excess of acid, but at some point we added so much base that then we start having an excess of base. So at the beginning, the acid 
is in excess, at the end, the base is in excess, which means that at the middle, somewhere, let's use a different color, maybe somewhere here, the acid equals the base. So the analyte equals the titrant, which means we are at the equivalence point. The equivalence point doesn't have to be seven. Because remember, sometimes when you have a mixture of an acid and a base, when the acid and the base have the same amount, the pH is not seven. Um, we did that example with um, acetic acid and sodium hydroxide that when we have the same amount of both of them, the pH is closer to nine. So this pH is not necessarily going to be seven, especially because here we have two different weak species. It might be close to seven, but it doesn't have to be seven. Okay, so we got the titration, and there's a few things we can do with this titration. The first thing is we could find the concentration of analyte in the sample. And this will be really similar to what we did with with the titration with with the pH indicator. So for here, I will just look at my graph and I find my equivalence point, which is basically the same as the endpoint. I look at my x-axis and let's say this says 20 milliliters so it took 20 milliliters of titran to get to that equivalence point so i use my that value so i say 20 milliliters of nh3 were required to get to the equivalence point i'm going to change that two liters and i know my concentration, which is 0 0.5 molar. So in one liter, I have 0 0.5 moles of NH3. And I know that they react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So one mole of NH3 reacts with one mole of acetic acid. So I can say that the moles of acetic acid in this titration were 0 0.01 moles. And to find the concentration of acetic acid, I need the moles and I need the liters. I know I have 0 0.01 moles, and I wrote down that I titrated eight milliliters, so that will be 0 0.008. So the concentration was 1.25 molar of acetic acid in this titration. So the idea of finding the concentration is fairly simple or fairly similar to the pH indicator. For the pH indicator, we look to figure out the amount of the volume we needed for that indicator to change color. For the titration with the pH probe, you're trying to figure out how much volume we needed for that pH value to go from acidic to basic. It's always like that in between to change from one thing to another. For pH indicator is from one color to a different color. For the pH probe is from one side of the pH scale to the other side of the pH scale.
So these two titrations work the same. But let's say that I actually have another question. I want to find the identity of my analyte, which in this case, I know it's acetic acid, but um, this type of calculation, this type of problems, you, you're actually able to figure out what unknown acid you have. And how do you do that? Okay, so I'm gonna rebuild my graph again. So I have a graph that is pH and its volume of titrant. And the graph should look something like that. Okay, so at the beginning, right here, what I have in my container, so I'm gonna put one, one, actually this use letters. So here I'm gonna call this A. A, I have vinegar. And I do not have titrant, which means that is a hundred percent acid. Then here at the equivalence point, so I'm gonna call that B. B, the vinegar is gone because it reacted with my titrant, which means that I have zero percent acid. Everything is gone. So I can actually think about this in terms of conjugate base. So here in B, my acid completely reacted, which means like all my acid is now 100% conjugate. At the beginning, I, my acid was almost 100%. So I have X amount of conjugate base. And we know that that X amount is really small. So I'm gonna assume that it's about 0% conjugate base which means that at the beginning of the reaction here at A is 100% acid, almost 0% conjugate base. Here at B, I have 0% acid and almost 100% conjugate base. And in the middle, I will have 50-50. Hopefully this makes some sense. So if we are at the 50-50, that means that the concentration of acid equals the concentration of conjugate base. And if that is true, and I try to find the pH, which is um, one of the equations um, will be the pKa plus the log of A minus over HA, where A minus is the conjugate base and HA is the acid. If this is true, that means that A minus over HA equals one, which means that the pH equals the pKa plus the log of one, and the log of one is zero. So then the pH equals the pKa. So right here, halfway 
halfway to get it to the equivalence point, the pH equals the pKa. So if I don't know the acid, I will potentially just go here and look back to the pH scale and you will see that you get something like 4.74, which means in this case, the pH equals the pKa, which equals 4.74. So then I can say that if pKa equals 4.74, then Ka equals 10 to the negative 4.74, which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So then I could just use this number and look at a table with different Ka values and figure out what acid you're working with. Last thing before I stop talking, because I'm pretty sure you guys are already burned out with all the information I try you. Um, so here we got 0% base 100% acid. Here, here in deep we have 0% acid, 100% base. So here in all this area, we have a mixture of acid with conjugate base. And a mixture of an acid and its conjugate base, we call them buffers. So this area here, we call it the buffer region. So you will see that sometimes we say the pH equals the pKH in the middle of the buffer region because we call all this area a buffer because buffers are areas that are full of acid and its conjugate base. And that was a lot of information. 